You know, in days before video games, I think one of the most elaborate fantasies for children, outside of their own imaginations, would be a model train set. That's why for a hundred years, that was the kind of iconic Christmas gift, or sometimes a family would set one up around a Christmas tree to the child's wonder and amazement. And some people didn't grow out of the fascination with it. I mean, I've known grown men, maybe there's some in the room, who have in their basements the largest room in the house set aside for a lifetime's work that few people ever even see. Uh, The model train world set up with models of almost everything imaginable from from trees to water towers. I can remember as a little boy, uh, the the closest city to us, and city would be a place that had like a McDonald's and a mall. Uh, I grew up in rural western Kentucky, and we would uh, drive across the Ohio River to Evansville, Indiana, and there was a McDonald's, and there was a mall, and there was also a museum. And in the museum, the thing that fascinated me was this huge model train set that they had all set up with a village and everything that you can imagine. I remember being amazed at the train chugging around the tracks, going through the the towns and the tunnels and over bridges. Well, I I think that this idea of a sort of world set up that looks alive but really isn't, this inanimate village, illustrates at least one aspect of people made in the image of God but who aren't alive spiritually. Formally, everyone is made in the image of God, all of us, all humans. God's purpose in creation is to make his glory known, thus the the name of this conference, Magnify, is in line with why we understand we draw breath, why we understand we're alive. We're to magnify our creator. We're to magnify the Lord. That's the purpose for all of us. God's glory is to be reflected in beauty, in order, in loving, constructive relationships, in satisfaction, in intelligence, in skillfulness, in creativity, in so many ways. So what you and I have experienced today with with food, with commerce, how we've benefited from manufacturing, if you like poetry or have listened to music or you've appreciated architecture. All of these things are reflections of God's own image in people, whether they're Christians or non-Christians. You know, Christianity is the most realistic religion in that it's sort of two-eyed when looking at people. It understands that we're all made in the image of God, so even the worst of people can do good things, and it understands that we're all fallen, so even the best of people sin. There's not a, a wrong, despairing nihilism nor is there the wrong manipulative utopianism that ends up being so sinister. But instead, there's a a two-eyed realistic look at the world. Everyone is made in the image of God. We're not surprised when foul living Mozart composes beautiful music. That music is to the glory of God, even if he didn't intend it as such. It reflects something of God's glory, nor are we surprised, though we're saddened, when we look into our own heart if we're Christians and yet see sin, find wrong motivations regret actions that we've taken. We're like Cadillacs that have gone off the cliff and they've hit the bottom floor of the valley and as messed up as they are down there, they're still Cadillacs. That's what people are like made in the image of God and yet fallen. To to drop the images for a moment, I've used a couple of different images there. People are made in God's image, but all of us are completely alienated from our Heavenly Father. Our sin is our rebellion against Him, and it brings death and judgment ultimately upon us. In the meantime, it brings spiritual barrenness. So the way some people think about this life and spirituality and religion and even Christianity is that Faith is laying there kind of innate in everybody. We all have our own kind of spirituality. It's there in every person, and it simply needs to be kind of stirred up. These are the kind of warm devotional books that are sold in grocery stores. This is the kind of pablum that goes out over TV so often. 
on TBN and other choice networks. This is what we find again and again people actually think is Christianity. Friends, this is the, the popular version of spirituality that appears to affirm everyone and everything, well, affirm everyone and everything except those who would disagree with it. But they'll affirm every, everyone else and everything else. Now, as this annual end of the year is approaching us with Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's a time for celebrating human brightness for many people, from the warmth of family love to gift giving. These are times as one year ends and another begins for gathering up good memories and getting families together at Thanksgiving and again together at Christmas and filled with food and turkey and gifts and children's pageants and grandma's pudding and snow and holly. We bring all of our best and we put it together for a couple of meals at the end of November and the end of December and we feel good about ourselves. But friends, that's not all Christianity is. That's not fundamentally what Christianity is. And if you're here tonight thinking that to be a Christian means to be a really good person, a really religious person, a person who can really lean into Thanksgiving and Christmas and have a kind of spirituality about it, I would like you to understand a little more clearly what it really means, according to the Bible, to know God and to be a Christian. Let me give you one more image. Is the fire innate in an unlit furnace? No. No, the, the furnace is designed and built for fire, but fire isn't a part of it. It's not innate to it. That, that fire, like our own physical life, has to be supplied from outside. That spark of fire that will get the furnace burning. Our house in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill is over 130 years old. And I think when we moved in there 20 years ago, most all of the implements in it were over 130 years old. And I know that every time the wind blew, the hot water heater would go out. And I know that fire was not innate to that hot water heater. It had to be supplied again and again underneath it to make it go. Well, friends, the part of God's Word I want us to look at tonight tells us about the very heart and genesis of the church and of all true Christian faith. And what we find is that true Christian faith is not that thing that is innate, that's lying there, inborn in all people, but rather it is brought to us from outside. Take away one basic point tonight. That's what I want you to see from God's Word. Please turn to your Bibles and to the New Testament. Go to the letters of Paul, that longest and best known one, Romans. Go to Romans chapter 10. While you're turning there, since I'm going to guess this is largely a pretty Christian audience, I mean, we know that they're Baptists and Reformed and Presbyterian. We don't know if they're Christians, but... Um, so those of us who are here tonight, presuming we're Christians, that's good. If you had three messages you could give at a conference, and the conference is supposed to be on the topic of the church, what would you talk about? How would you break it down? Ideas? Anybody? Election. Election. Yeah, well, that would be fine, but uh, <laughs> particularly on the church, and I've got three messages. What would be a good thing to speak on? Put up a hand, somebody. What's your name? Reed. Reed, where are you? I know that, but Reed, I mean, you know, where are you usually? <laughs> URC, okay, so what do you think? Who are the, how do I get three messages out of who are the members? Okay, somebody else, any other ideas? <laughs> what would be just a, a good kind of three messages to give on the church? And if you were in a meeting with me today and know the answer to this, do not answer. I'm just asking the general Christian populace who's here. Yes. What's your name? Steve. Steve, where are you from? Uh, Clarkson, Michigan. Okay. Worship, discipleship, and should be a number of others. <laughs> okay, worship and discipleship. Sounds like Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Church, 1995. Not bad. Okay. Yeah. Well, those are good things. They're in the Bible. Yep. I talk about those things. That's not, the, that's not a three. Yeah, up there. Somebody up there. Yep. 
Wait, Dale. Dale, that's right. Um, Boom. He got it. <laughs> Leave it to the OPC brother to like get onto it immediately. That's right. Yeah, I've got three messages on the church, so what, I'm, what am I going to do? I'm going to talk about the three marks of the church. The right preaching of the Word of God, the right administration of baptism of the Lord's Supper. What is he going to say about that? And the, <laughs> and the right administration of church discipline. So I've got three messages. That's what I'm going to kind of do. You'll see as we go through each one how I'm doing it. So this first one is the most fundamental one. Beza, Theodore, Theodore Beza actually thought that this was the only mark of a true church the one we're talking about tonight, the right preaching of the Word of God. And at the end of the day, I think he may be close to right on that. But anyway, it, it's certainly fundamental. And I thought of a number of different passages to preach about the, the generative authority of God's Word, the, the, the role God gives His Word in creating life and bringing that spiritual fire. I thought of God's promise going to Abram in Genesis 12. You know, there, there's no people of God without His promise coming first. That begins to create that's the seed that's planted. And so I thought of going there. I thought of going to Psalm 119. I just preached through Psalm 119 at my church in D.C. And just had a glorious time reveling in God's Word, that longest chapter in God's Word, about God's Word. And you, you see that the power and the life that God brings. I thought about going to the vision of the valley of the dry bones in Ezekiel 37, where Ezekiel, prophet to an exiled people who wondered in losing their land had they lost their God, is given this vision of this valley full of dry bones. And what is he supposed to do? He's supposed to prophesy to them, speak to them. And do you know what? In this vision, when he does that, the bones come to life. So the point is that life comes through the Spirit, through the Word being preached. Uh, I thought about going to that wonderful little parable Jesus tells in Mark 4 about the power of the Word and, and, and the Word causing the, everything to grow. Uh, apart from uh, human effort fundamentally, it would be the work of God. But I decided to go for the simplicity of Romans chapter 10. So we're in Romans chapter 10. See, that way I got a whole bunch of series in suggestively in this one message. We're just going to go for Romans. I just simply want us to look especially at two verses in Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 16 and 17. Now, if you're not used to looking at a Bible, the chapter numbers are the big numbers, the little numbers after that are the verse numbers. We're in verses 16 and 17. So, uh, I think this passage well illustrates the fact that the spark of faith that God uses to reignite our relationship with Him is supplied by the Word of God being preached to us. The spark of faith that God uses to reignite our relationship with Him is supplied by the Word of God being preached to us. That Word of God preached must be believed. It is not always believed, even though it's when it's preached. But when it is believed, that faith we read in Ephesians 2 from the passage just before what was read to us a few moments ago, when that faith is believed, it is a gift of God. No one can boast about it. This is why we can pray for our family and friends who are not Christians, why we can pray for them to believe when they hear, because it is God's Spirit who gives the new birth to us spiritually, the sign and substance of which is to believe the message about Christ preached to us. And what begins our faith continues to feed it. Look at our passage, Romans chapter 10, verse 16. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Quoting Isaiah 53. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. It's the message about Jesus Christ proclaimed to us, shared with us, and then believed by us that causes us to spring to life when we had been as spiritually inanimate as figures in a model train village. This is what, spiritually speaking, reconciles God to us and us to God. The point of it all is Jesus Christ 
The proclamation is about him. Uh, the promise is not that everyone will believe, but the promise is that this is how everyone who will believe comes to have this faith through the, the preaching and the sharing of the good news about Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, sent by the Father, come to be our Savior, our Redeemer, our Deliverer. That's what Paul is sharing about in these two verses. And that's what I pray will be clear to each of us tonight. I pray that God will use us to feed our faith and even to give the gift of faith to some who maybe even still at this very moment don't yet believe in Christ. And friends, in a, in a group with hundreds of people here, could there not be that some people here tonight like that? Perhaps that's you. I want us to think about four things. So if you're a note taker, and if you're here at church on Friday night, some of you are. I'll just make it simple for you. You don't have to hunt for Waldo. I'll tell you where he is. All right? Number one, the point. Number two, the proclamation. Number three, the problem. Number four, and the promise. Mark, those all start with the same letter. I am Baptist. Number one. Number one, the point. First, the point. And it's really found in the last word of the passage. Look there at verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17. <clears throat> Christ. We have to start at the end because he is that out of which all the rest of this really grows. God has given us no good promise apart from Christ. God has given us no good promise apart from Christ. We have no object of our faith other than Christ. In the early 90s, I was uh, a college worker and a PhD student at the same time at Cambridge in England. And the Kansas City prophets were big in some corners of the charismatic world. And they had prophesied that revival was coming to Britain in that October. Now, why they had been prophesying that revival wasn't coming then in March when we were then, or April or May, or the Lord was waiting for I don't know, but but they had been prophesying that it was coming in October, and they were the, the students who were into this were believing this, were going around telling the students that they needed to understand this and rejoice and pray and repent and, and needed to focus on this. And, and I remember having some careful and deliberate conversations with these friends that actually the object of our faith, according to the Bible, is not a claim made by a preacher in America, but it's Jesus Christ. He is the only object of our faith. He is what we need to believe. We need to hear of nothing or no one more than of Christ. Indeed, if we never hear of him, it won't matter what else we do hear about. We have no message more important than the message about Christ. We have no subject more important, no source for the true knowledge about ourselves or about God, more sure, no purpose, even in being here tonight on a Friday night, than Christ. We can't really begin this study by talking about why people didn't believe in verse 16, you see there, or what it means that they didn't believe, or what it means that we do, or how we come to if we don't understand and consider exactly what belief we're talking about. And that is the belief that Jesus Christ, as the Messiah, promised in the Old Testament, the Son of God, fully man and fully God, with a real body, emotions, intellect, tempted but without ever surrendering to distrusting his heavenly Father, Christ who is worthy of the everlasting praise of all of us who have ever lived, of certainly of each person here, but really of everyone in the whole world and all the other creatures God has made, the one whose love causes us to wonder, whose righteousness is glorious, who rules over all the world with truth and grace, who has come to be a second Adam to liberate us, from the curse that we are under because of our sins and the sins of our first parents, whose reign brings such joy that we sing like we just did those two songs, we realize that in Jesus Christ, 
The King has come to save us. He is the sinless, glorious one who was crucified and raised and exalted for us. The one who sends his very own spirit to us to bring about the new birth to all who believe in him, to forgive us for our sins, to make us alive again spiritually, being loved by God and loving him in return, trusting him with all of our days and all of our moments, thanking him for all of our joys and relying on him in all of our trials till he brings us home to himself. That is the news that we have that is so good. It's not a made-up fairy tale. It's not a way that we Christians like to look at the world. It's the truth. We've come to know it. Somebody has shared it with us, and we've, we've seen by God's grace that it's true. And it's in, indescribably good news. It, it is wonderful when the truth turns out to be good. And friends, here, the most important of all truths is the best of all truths. And it all has to do with Christ. Friends, beware listening to preaching or religious instruction which says things about Jesus different or contrary to these things that I've just said. What I've just said has been a summary of biblical truth. There will finally be no good news in it if this Christ is not at the very center and heart of it all. I was talking with some friends this afternoon about evangelism. We we're talking about different evangelism tools and and a tool that I like to use, I was talking to a girl at, at our church who was just visiting two nights ago after our Bible study on Wednesday night about this. Uh, a tool we like to use is called Christianity Explained. A slightly longer version of it is called Christianity Explored. It just walks a person through Mark's gospel. Friends, Jesus is at the very center of the message that we have to share with others. Christ is the one who, he said in John 6, 38, came down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Okay, if we claim to be his followers, isn't that what we want to do? Don't we want to do God's will among our friends, among our friends at school or in our family or at work? What does it mean for us to do God's will? It's Friday night. We get a couple of days rest. And Lord willing, Monday, another week starts. What will it mean for us to do God's will? will this coming week? Well, if you believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is and <clears throat> calls us in the Bible to teach this, then pray and resolve to follow him and resolving to resolve to, with him, follow God in his will. Pray that your children would see your joy as you follow this Christ in your home, that your, your co-workers would see that it's because of Christ that your joy is beyond the reach of your trials. Praise God that he has called us together around himself, that at the center of our faith is not merely five pillars of our behavior or an eightfold path of our duties, but a person, the living God, glorious and beautiful in his might in his rule, in his holiness, in his promises. Friends, it is a joy to know and serve this God. So we won't understand this portion of God's word if we don't begin there. Jesus Christ is the point of it all. Second, the proclamation. The proclamation we're talking about is proclaiming this great truth about Jesus that we've just been talking about, about who he is and what he's done. So unless I've misunderstood them, this is what separates so many other philosophies and religions from Christianity. So the message of Confucianism or of Buddhism or of Islam or of Marxism is presented as something greater than Confucius or Buddha or Muhammad or Marx. They are taken to be enlightened thinkers or prophets who have handed on their understanding to others. 
who are then invited to step into their way of living, kind of like the guy in my study one time who was looking through my books, and he was, uh, he was talking about a certain person, and I started to pull off a biography from my shelf of this person, and this guy looks at it, and he pushes the book back in, and he says, I'm not really interested in the man, just his work. Well, you know, you can do that, I think, with all the other religions followed by millions of people around the globe. Someone else could teach us Gautama's eightfold path. But friends, Christianity could not be more different than that. Who Jesus was and is and what he has done and will do are indispensably the core of our message. So like I say, somebody else might teach us Gautama's eightfold path or Gandhi's nonviolence or Marx's economics or even Muhammad's Quran or Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon, once written. But with Jesus Christ, it's different. He, in his person, is the center of his own message. So when you have a friend at school or a friend in your neighborhood who's not a Christian that you're talking with, Help them to see how all religions aren't basically the same. All the religions except Christianity are kind of basically the same. Various forms of what I do to get good. But Christianity is all about Jesus Christ. If a person wants to argue with you about whether the Bible is totally, completely true, don't be fooled into that argument. Talk to them about Christ. Talk to them about who Christ is. All they need in the Bible initially, at least, for that kind of conversation is are the Gospels sufficiently reliable historically? Talk to them about Jesus. Help them to see who Jesus is. Without him being who he claimed to be and without him doing what he claimed he'd come to do, there is no Christian message. Our message is about Christ. Christ. So that's what that last phrase in verse 17 means. You see, the word of Christ. It could mean that word, the teachings that Christ himself spoke. But because of what Paul has just said up in verses uh, 7 and 8 and 9 about the word that he was preaching to them, uh, the word about Christ, uh, that seems most clearly what it means. And you'll see this in your own church's life. There are probably, what, five or ten different churches represented here. Listen, in two days you're going to be getting together, Lord willing. You're going to be singing. And listen to the songs you sing. All of your songs will not be about Christian morality, how we should live. Some of them will be about Christian experience. Well, that's fine. Some of the psalms are about the experience of the person of faith. But probably most of the songs will be about God and specifically about Jesus and about who Jesus is, what Jesus is like, what Jesus has done for us, what Jesus said he will do for us, and we praise him for that. Friends, that's because Jesus is at the very center of our proclamation. Okay, so what is this word about Christ? It's the gospel. What is the gospel? It is this good news that God has loved us as he has by sending his only son, that whosoever would believe on him, that means would credit, would, would hear and listen to and understand and agree with what he says about himself and about us, that he is holy and we are sinful, that he has come as our Savior to die on the cross as a substitute, in the place of all those who would ever repent of their sins and trust in him. That God raised him from the dead and he was exalted to heaven to show that God had accepted this sacrifice on behalf of all those who would come to know and trust him. And the command that comes to us now is to hear this extraordinary message and to believe it and so to follow him, to repent of our sins, and to rely our whole life on him. And if we do, then we're forgiven of our sins. And the relationship that we were made to have with God 
is restored. We are reconciled to God. And friend, I want you to understand, what I'm telling you is that's why you're alive. More than anything else, more than your family, more than your job, more than other kinds of self-expression, more than the number of your Facebook friends, your Twitter followers. That's why you're alive. That's the true bottom line. I pray you will be dissatisfied tonight if that is not why you think you're alive. I pray that you will come to find those things that you've made to be at the center of the solar system of your life lacking gravity and being able to hold your life together. And I pray that not so that finally bad things will come upon you, but so that you will see the good that there is in this great good news about Jesus. Now, friend, if you're here and you're a Christian, I just want to ask you, are you sharing this great message with those around you each week? Are you letting them know? You can't assume that just because you're not inside the beltway, but you're outside the beltway of Washington, D.C., that everyone's saved. Share the good news with others. Be, be kind to them. You realize you can be kind to people that you work with. You can be kind to people in your job, and that's great, but it's entirely insufficient. You could just be a very sweet agnostic. I, I've got friends that I know who are, I had a friend greet me yesterday when I was taking a walk around Capitol Hill. Very sweet, secular Jewish man. He and I have gone on some short trips together. I've gotten to know his family a bit. He couldn't be kinder to me. But that kindness doesn't reflect the Holy Spirit of God in a reconciled soul of someone reconciled to God through Christ. Friends, your sweetness to people at work is entirely insufficient. You need to tell them. You need to share the good news, this good news with them. And then when you do, do not use Jesus' statements in the Gospels about not telling our good deeds before others to not share then with other Christians what you've done. I would say risk the pride in your motivation, risk people misunderstanding, and in your churches start circulating stories of sharing the gospel in normal settings. Just risk pride. Risk other people thinking you're proud. Just tell other people gently, humbly, about how with God's help you were able to tell this person in your next door neighbor's house about Christ. How you were able to tell your cousin about Christ. How you were able to share the gospel with the person on the bus about Christ. Friend, pray that God would make us faithful. God has kindly built reflections of this message into our lives in so many ways. Through our parents' care, through the love of a husband and a wife, Christ is the reality of the best that all of these patterns in life are pointing to. So do you understand this message about Jesus Christ? Is there some reason you think that you, you shouldn't share it with others? Do you continue to turn it over in your own mind and heart as something precious, not just to others, but to you? Pray for your own church, that your own church would continue to cherish this message, that you would get it right. Oh, friends, what a joy to be constantly sharing it with others, to be encouraging each other to do that as well. And isn't God kind to use us in all this? That's what Romans 10 really stresses. I don't know if you've read Romans 10 recently, but it, it, it stresses God's inclusion of us as the means of His saving His people. So God is going to save his people. That's an extraordinary story right there. But here's the amazing thing that Romans 10 makes so clear. He is going to do that amazing thing through us, through churches that send preachers, through preachers who go to preach, through people sharing the good news about Jesus Christ with others. We are part of that great story. God is going to save his people, and he will do it through us. Friends, that means that we must speak. So God speaks through his word and calls all of us in our various situations, from, from shepherds to tax accountants, to share this great news with others. So, so let's pray that we be faithful with this, and that those with whom we've shared won't just listen, but will believe this message about Christ. Thank God others shared with us. 
And thank God that he calls folks from our number to take this gospel around the world. Friends, this is what we want to do. God can even use Notre Dame football players to share the gospel. Charles, stand up. Charles was a Notre Dame football player. He really was. And I brought him right here to East Lansing, Michigan. There he is. <laughs> Don't worry, the four years he played, he told me they lost most of the time to Michigan State. Anyway, you can be seated. But Charles was on a trip. He's on staff at our church. He was on a trip with me recently. And uh, I'm burrowing away, reading a book in one seat. Right next to me is Charles. And he's spending three or four hours lovingly sharing the gospel with this person in the seat next to him. I love that. Friends, that should be typical of our lives. We have great news to tell others. But how will they know it if we don't tell them? We are part of that great plan. We want to have a part in proclaiming this joyful message. Third, but here's the great problem, number three. Here's the great problem that Paul was wrestling with in this passage. It was all his fellow countrymen who had no faith in Jesus as the Christ, the long-promised Messiah. Look again at verse 16. But not all the Israelites accepted or obeyed the good news. Why would Paul say that? Well, because he knew that from very painful personal experience. Sometimes when Paul had tried to tell others, he was ignored. Sometimes he was literally shouted down. Some he had shared this message with scorned him and scorned his message. Their response was anything but believing him. That's really the wrestling that's going on in Romans 9, 10, and 11. That's what's going on in these three chapters of Romans. Paul is trying to get his head around the fact, how can God's promises in Scripture, Old Testament, be true? And yet the people of God, the nation of Israel, the Jews, the Hebrews, not be accepting the Messiah when he's come. That's what he's, he's working through. So here in Romans chapter 10, verse 16, after emphasis in verse 15, you see just above it, on the word being so valued that even the feet of those who bring it are considered beautiful, Paul returns to the idea that as wonderful as message as it is, and as great as the responsibility is to get the message out, you look back up in verses 13 and 14. You know, he's about to return to that in verse 17. Those who hear must believe in order for it to do any good. And here in verse 16, he makes it clear that not all those who've heard have believed. We see the, the truth of Jesus' surprising un-PC words in Luke 12, 51. Do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but division. That's Jesus. Luke 12, 51. Put that on your t-shirt and wear it around campus. <laughs> what about earlier in Luke's gospel? Where the angelic hosts at Christ's birth proclaim, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Well, that's right. That, that's certainly true. That's why Christ came. But that peace was initially and fundamentally a peace between God and those who would be reconciled to him through the work of Christ. And while that work would progress and grow as the news was spread, there would also be many who would oppose Christ's reign and would ignore his work. Between those and Christ's followers, there would be division. Some would respond to the news and accept this great revelation, this invitation, but not all would. Not all who have simply heard have really heard. That is, heard effectually to the point of accepting and obeying, welcoming and heeding. Friends, the faith that we are called to is not a passive hearing of the good news about Christ, but it is an active accepting, a responding kind of hearing. This is a message that should, should be obeyed but in fact in the case of so many of those that Paul preached to when you read through the book of Acts 
that which was heard was not obeyed. The faith that saves is the faith that obeys. But it's not the obedience that saves us. But they weren't accepting it at all. They were like folks being given a prescription they desperately needed. But instead of filling the prescription and taking the medicine, just throwing it away. They were like people who would hear the best of news and act like they'd never heard it at all. The good news would have become good to them had they accepted and obeyed it and rejoiced over it. But too many of the Israelites did not greet their Messiah like that. So then here in verse 16, as Paul does elsewhere, he reminds himself, he's talking himself through this, and he reminds his readers that even this widespread rejection so funny listening to American evangelicals who focus on Capitol Hill act like the sky is falling because all of a sudden they're becoming less popular in their country. What religion did they think they were getting into? You know, the guy at the end of the Gospels, he's crucified. We say we want to follow him. Now, yes, he's resurrected, he's raised. But friends, he himself told us that if we would follow him, we must take up our cross. That's the reality Paul's dealing with here. He's looking at all these people who didn't greet the Messiah. And in verse 16, he's, he's reflecting on this widespread rejection that had been predicted by God's prophets. That's what helps him. It helps him to see that, wait, God actually said it would be this way. And so he goes back to the prophet Isaiah in that wonderful chapter 53. And in that chapter 53, it begins for Isaiah says the Lord who has believed our message? That's a statement of like, who has believed our message? And that, like, no one has believed our message. Why is no one believing our message? They should have believed. Because the truth was that the God who had chosen the Jews and called them and led them for 2,000 years had finally loved the world in this way. He sent his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This should have caused unrestrained, unspeakable joy. Instead, the news was met with cold rejection. But Paul says this is not surprising. This unbelief was predicted in the ancient prophets. He cites Isaiah 53 asking the rhetorical question about who has believed, which implied that few have believed it. Certainly not everyone. And what is it that not everyone has believed? Our message, he says. That's the report we brought. It's the good news about Christ. Now, friends, you understand, if you've read your Bible for any times, that though this is unusual, this is actually a pattern in the Bible. It's an unusual pattern, but it's definitely a pattern. So God tells Moses to instruct the children of Israel before they go into the promised land, and then he tells Moses to tell the children of Israel that they will not listen and faithfully obey him. And he then tells them what he will do to them then and then how he will lead them back. Deuteronomy 28, 29, you can read it later. Later in Israel's history, God tells his prophets, like Isaiah here, that Paul quotes, or like Ezekiel and Habakkuk and Hosea and others, the same thing. It also happened when Christ came. Even Christ himself came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. John 1.11. So this rejection by disbelief is what Jesus himself had experienced. And I think of that passage over in John 12. John 12, verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? John's quoting the same passage from Isaiah. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, 
He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Now you see what Paul is doing now is he is truly following in the path of Christ. He was experiencing that same kind of rejection. And like Christ, in one sense, he was wrestling with it. I don't know about you, but as I find this kind of fulfilled predictions in the Bible, I am more and more amazed at the truthfulness of the Bible. I'm now going off my main point, and this is just a little sidebar. I've been a Christian for almost 40 years, long time. I was an agnostic, became a Christian. I was a very argumentative agnostic, then I became an argumentative Christian. Adjective stayed the same, the noun changed. In my early days as a Christian, I would read pious writings from the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries that describe the majesty of God's word. And my formerly agnostic brain would just dismiss such stuff as a, a kind of softer age with more subjective truths proving what people already believed anyway. And I still feel that about some of those adjectives. Though I devotionally feel that about scripture, I don't feel I could objectively prove that in any way. This kind of stuff is a little different. Having rummaged around the Bible pretty thoroughly for a few decades now, I'm quite confident to say there is not another book like this on the planet. The Bhagavad Gita is nothing like this. The Quran's nothing like this. The Book of Mormon is nothing like this. Friends, this is an amazing book. There are, are countless things that are predicted that then happen that were entirely outside of the ability of the one first predicting it to bring about. And when you see more and more the connection between the history of the people of Israel and God's work among them and the New Testament and Jesus and Paul and places like this, and you see how this whole thing fits together like the most majestic cathedral you've ever seen, you begin to understand God himself has given us an amazing gift in his word. Back to my main point. There's nothing to reject in what so many people preach as faith today. Remember, it's something I said that they would say everybody has, merely a kind of exalted self-confidence. That kind of general religious faith asks nothing of us, it demands nothing, it delivers nothing. It's kind of lowest common denominator spirituality. But that's not what we're called to believe or to share with others. We're called to share with others the word of Christ, the truth about Jesus. Some people may wonder, well, how do I know when or how much to share and when not to? Yeah, I'm not sure. Pray for wisdom. Ask counsel from friends. Realize that sometimes you are called to spin down the relational capital you have built up over the years with that person you have cared for during their surgery, with that person you have helped with their schoolwork, with that person that you have befriended over the years on the team. You are called to spin down that relational capital. Other times you, you should probably wisely build it up. Pray for God to give you wisdom. But remember that the ultimate goal of their being reconciled to God that goal of their being reconciled to God may involve some amount of them not liking you because of what you tell them. Sometimes I've seen well-meaning Christians assume that the more their non-Christian friends like them, the more they like Jesus. And the less they like them, the less they like Jesus. That's not true. Our non-Christian friends may end up not liking us or not liking us for a season as we tell them the truth. But our goal is for them to be reconciled to God. 
I pray that God would give every Christian here wisdom at this point in our relationships, that we would know how far to push. Paul's concern here stands as a needed reminder, I think, to us that we can be faithful in preaching, we can be faithful in sharing, but not successful in seeing those that we preach to converted. Share the message as well as we may. There's no success without the Spirit of God. So in our families, we share the truth of the gospel. We can't be sure of what response we'll get. We've got one dear member of our church who goes out every Saturday sharing the gospel with Muslims in the mall. She is of Arabic background herself. She uses Arabic as she speaks to them. She's been thrown out of mall after mall after mall in the D.C. area. She keeps going and sharing the gospel. I love that. I trust that God is going to honor that with conversions. We should certainly beware changing the message in an attempt to get those we love to accept Christ. Any idea of a faith that saves us from God's wrath, which is also a faith with no interest in obeying God, is simply an illusion. And it's a dangerous snare. And so we share the gospel honestly and we pray, aware that God's Spirit must give the gift of faith. We care for those who don't believe, but we're not surprised by their disbelief. We're not discouraged by it. Remember, even Christ himself faced those who were constantly at the temple, who taught God's word to others, but who were at heart strangers to God himself when he came. That's the problem of hearing the gospel and not responding with true faith. Last point to notice is this, number four, the great promise. The great promise that he gives here is that we could be saved through faith in Christ. Look again at verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. If you just stare down at the passage, what, what Paul is doing here is getting back up to his main point in verses 13 and 14 and 15. Paul really summarizes the chapter so far here. Verses 14 and 15 had been about the general call of the gospel, which was go out to all. Now in verse 16, Paul again returns to the hard reality that not all who hear will believe. Though hearing does not only result in faith, that's why he writes verse 16. Verse 17 tells us that faith only comes through hearing this message. So though you won't get an apparent success every time you share it by their response, that should be no discouragement to sharing it because nobody will come to know Christ if you don't share that message. So you share that message. And he tells us, he's picking up that claim that faith comes through hearing up in verse 14 and showing specifically what that must be a hearing of. That's a good thing to practice with each other. If you want to join our church, one of the things we ask in a membership interview is in 60 seconds or less, what's the good news of Jesus Christ? Tell us the gospel. We want to make sure that all of our members know what this good news of Jesus Christ is. Faith comes by hearing that message. In that sense, faith is by listening. So listening to this message is the means God may use to bring some to saving faith. Hearing the message about Christ is not a sufficient cause. I mean that in a strict sense, in the sense that some people hear and still don't believe. But it is a necessary cause of faith. No one can believe the promise of God without hearing the gospel. And Paul stresses here that there is only one message which can give rise to this faith. This hearing is only through one particular means. Though hearing can, of course, be done by reading something or by hearing it said verbally. That saving word is the message about Christ, the message Christ himself had charged his disciples to take in the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Paul had really defined this, if you look up a few verses up in verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is the word about Christ. 
Now notice how this saving faith comes. It comes by hearing this message about Christ. Not by our doing or our networking or our competence. Not by our baptism or our taking the Lord's Supper or even by that prayer we prayed. The saving faith is certainly not innate. It's not therefore in everybody and the gospel merely awakens it in us. I read one paraphrase of Romans 10 and that's how it actually translated that. That it awakens faith. That's a horrible way to put this. This faith comes to us only by hearing the message about Christ. And of course, this is exactly what we would expect from Jesus' own teaching. What did Jesus do the very last night of his earthly ministry? He specifically prayed in John 17 for those who will believe in me through their message. And then later in Acts, when Peter preaches to Cornelius, the first sort of Gentile household, in Acts chapter 10, what does he say? Luke records the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on all who heard the message, just as Cornelius had been told it would be. Acts eleven fourteen. he will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. So friends, I want you to see clearly that from the first night of Christ's birth with the angels heralding the message, Christianity has had everything to do with a message being shared with the right preaching of the Word of God. And that message is not about our faith. I believe. believe. It's about the object of our faith. It's about Christ. And people being saved through hearing and believing that message about Christ. From day one, that's what it's been. So, we preach this message. And we pray for God to send His Spirit to accompany it. No amount of your intellect or charm will give someone saving faith in Christ. Only God can do that. Faith is received not as a reward for our work, but as a gift of God's grace. I love the fact that the way He set it all up, it's just that the mere hearing that that's all we do when we're saved even that evidence is the gracious nature of it let's say you're at a normal sunday at university reformed church you're here in this room kevin's preaching he preaches the gospel let's say he talks for 30 or 40 or 50 minutes and the congregation sits there with their mouths closed Some people think that that kind of monologue is an antiquated way to do things. It's ancient. has no relevance to our modern age in which everybody really just wants to look down at their iPhone and keep clicking through things. But friends, do you see with your iPhone, you're making choices all the time and doing things and involved and interactive. How different than this. God just saves us and we contribute nothing to it. You sitting there with your mouths closed and just listening to one person speaking is a great picture of how God just brings salvation to us. We do nothing to deserve it. We don't create it. It's a gracious gift that he gives to us. And so we preach and share and pray in our churches. So friend, if you are here and you've not believed this message about Jesus, I urge you to believe it. Trust in Christ alone so that God will forgive you for the ways you have sinned against him. That's why he came. Let this good news become good news to you today. If you need to pray, pray like the Father in Mark 9, 24. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It isn't always apparent who will believe. How many of us here this evening, one year before we were converted, looked like likely converts? One way you could celebrate the holidays this year is to tell the gospel to people. Give them the greatest gift you could ever give them. You know, there are many people around our world who have never heard it. Kevin, when's the next cross conference? So there's a cross conference in December or January of 2016? January of 2016. There's another event you can get to online in February. 
this coming February, just go to Cross Conference, find out more about how maybe you could be involved in getting the gospel to people who've never heard it. I thank God for the way that I have seen Christians give themselves to getting this message out again and again. Just Wednesday night in our Bible study, we had a guy who I don't know well at all from a church on the West Coast, but I know his pastor well, who shared about how when he was a 19-year-old young man, he had been reading Operation World and he was struck by this one nation in which there were no known Christians. And he resolved that he would give his life to make sure the gospel goes to that land and that there would be, if the Lord gave him life and strength, a church there before he died. So now, 14 years later, he's married with a child in his third year living in that land legally as a businessman, trying to set up a business that will work, found a business that the government will like and want to encourage. And so he's trying to learn the language and the culture well with his wife. He has resolved to make sure this good news about Christ goes there. My Christian friends, remember how the Bible here says faith comes by hearing the message about Christ. No faith comes without this message being spoken. No faith comes without this message being spoken. Look at over the last year. Are people around you coming to faith? Have you seen anyone you know obviously become a Christian this year? I've just preached that you can't control that. I understand. You can't make someone become a Christian. But friend, if you're not sharing the gospel with them, why would you bother praying for them? Share the gospel. Let them know this great news. Now, some simply don't believe. Paul faced in his time with so many of his own countrymen exactly that. But friends, some don't believe because they've never been told. Even in East Lansing, Michigan. Tell people. Tell people the good news. Break the silence. Like the angel host did that shocking, thrilling night 2,000 years ago. Break the silence and say to them the word about Christ that we've been seeing here in Romans chapter 10. That's the only way that anyone will ever come to have saving faith in Christ. Well, I have made the same point 37 times tonight, so we should conclude. I trust I've made myself clear. Romans 10, 16, and 17 is not convoluted. It's not difficult. It's clear, and it's hard. The first act of the congregation I have the privilege of pastoring took over 135 years ago now was to adopt a statement of faith, a statement of what they believed, they understood this message to be, what they understood that the Bible had always taught. So in our church we stated that we believe that justification was the great blessing of the gospel, that it was bestowed solely through faith in the Redeemer's blood. We said that it is the immediate duty of all to accept the blessings of salvation by a heartfelt, repentant, and obedient faith. We said that being born again always happens in a manner above our comprehension by the power of the Holy Spirit in connection with divine truth. And we said that we believe that repentance and faith are sacred duties and also inseparable graces worked in our souls by the regenerating Spirit of God. All of that we said and we say still. How can we still be giving out the same message all these decades later when so much around us changes and changes and changes again? How can your churches here in East Lansing be doing that? Because the faith that we believe is not a faith that we make up or invent. I'm amazed at the number of stories I'm seeing these days in the media. Like, when are they going to change? When are they going to change? Never. We, we never have. Our orthodoxy is older than the Eastern Orthodox. Our Catholicism is truly Catholic and older than Roman Catholicism. We, we believe what the New Testament taught. That's what we're going to keep teaching. They may kill us for it, or at least take away tax exemption. But we'll just keep teaching it. In, in D.C., they're trying to get rid of churches by putting marathons on every Sunday in the year, it seems like. <laughs> Nobody can get to our churches anymore. That's okay. You know, we're not having our heads chopped off yet. We'll just keep meeting, whoever can get there. Maybe we'll have to meet earlier in the morning. We'll just keep meeting. Because Jesus got up on Sunday. 
We'll meet on Sunday. We'll just keep rejoicing every week the Lord gives us. We'll just keep giving this same message because faith comes by hearing. Verse 17, faith comes by hearing. It did in Paul's day. It still does today. Even this day. Oh, friend, believe in Christ. Believe in Christ. That's the first mark of a true church. That that message is preached. And I may agree with Beza that that's the only truly essential mark of a church. But Kevin can instruct me about that at our conversation in just a few minutes. Let me close this in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for Christ. Thank you for loving us as you have in him. We are overwhelmed by your grace and mercy. We pray, Lord, that you would cause our hearts to be filled so that, filled so that our tongues would be loosed. Cause us to love those around us because of our love for you. Cause us to be faithful in telling this great message to others. Cause the churches here to be marked by a right preaching of this word. And so bring glory to yourself, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.